Gentlemen, welcome to Jerusalem Studio. During the Cold War, the Eastern Mediterranean was considered a potential front involving American and Soviet naval task forces. The Israeli Navy also clashed with those of Egypt and Syria. But now, the picture is much more complicated, with the main problem for the Jewish state being Turkish policy under President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who alienated Israel, Greece, Cyprus, Italy and Egypt in a dispute over sovereignty and energy. In tandem, there are also Israeli and Lebanese claims and counterclaims regarding a gas-rich corner of their common maritime boundary. To explore those developments in these two areas and more, we're joined from central Israel by Dr. Eran Lerman, who is the Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security and a lecturer at Shalem College in Jerusalem. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Also joining us from the city of Limassol in Cyprus is Mr. Polikarpos Gavrielidis, who is a scholar in international relations. Welcome. Uh, hello, thank you. And with me here in the studio is our TV7 analyst, Mr. Emil Oren. Provide us with uh, an overview of the current situation and what are the key points we should uh, take note of? So as you mentioned, uh, there are two uh, disputes. Uh, they are not uh, really connected. One, uh, the bigger dispute, um, involves Turkey, Greece, Italy, Egypt, Israel, and perhaps the United States too, uh, also France, with Germany uh, and the EU in general trying to mediate. Uh, Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo has been to both uh, mainland Greece, he was in uh, Thessaloniki, and to Crete, um, in midweek, trying uh, to uh, meet with uh, the leaders of uh, Greece and point out that uh, from the American perspective, uh, there is no validity to the Turkish claim that uh, Greek islands do not have uh, the same rights as every other uh, littoral country um, in the world. And uh, Pompeo said the same uh, exclusive economic zone, the same rights uh, would apply. And this is uh, one of the main points in the dispute in which Turkey and Greece are the main contenders, but also the other countries uh, mentioned. The uh, EU was supposed uh, to mediate um, in late uh, September. This uh, has been uh, delayed. Um, there is some um, note of de-escalation because earlier last uh, month uh, it seemed as if the uh, Turks are bent on confronting uh, uh, the Greek, but uh, apparently uh, for the time being uh, this has been uh, frozen. The other dispute has to do with energy, with Israel and Lebanon, and there too um, there is uh, mediation by the Americans, by the State Department, with the United Nations uh, as observer. Apparently, there is a formula being uh, suggested, uh, Israel uh, uh, having uh, some 40% of the disputed area, um, Lebanon having something less than 60%, of the area. The American uh, energy giant Chevron is coming in, taking the place of Nobel Energy. This is probably also helping uh, politically because it is a political powerhouse in Texas and otherwise. So we are having uh, two disputes which almost uh, flared up, but right now may uh, be de-escalating. Two disputes that, of course, uh, are translated into dozens of other disputes uh, across the region. Uh, Dr. Lehrman, I'd like to hear your perspective on the current situation vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the East Med and, of course, the uh, uh, signing of the East Med Forum, uh, ratifying it as an uh, international uh, organization, something that will also draw in not only France uh, and other countries that are keen on, on participating in this uh, uh, strategic area, but also the United States and the European Union, who have already submitted to become observers of this uh, uh, organization, something, of course, to the dismay of Turkey. Well, uh, definitely. The signing on the 22nd of September uh, of the Statute of the EMGF, the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum, which has been already, uh, it, it, like the breakthrough a week earlier with Bahrain and the Emirates, 
And this is not a dramatic shift. It is the crowning formal achievement of something that began, uh, in this case, two years ago. In January 2019, the EMGF was established as a consultative forum. Now it has been uh, established uh, formally as a, an intergovernmental, regional intergovernmental organization with its statute, with, with its headquarters in Cairo. This is very clearly a message to Erdogan that he cannot intimidate um, the countries of the region. And it comes in, in obviously in full support of the Greek-Egyptian um, EEZ delineation agreement um, of last uh, signed last month. So um, we should look at it definitely as a very um, important development. In the language of the um, uh, common of the joint declaration, there's a very interesting paragraph which I have seen actually in each and every one of the trilateral agreement uh, the declarations in the past between Israel, Greece, and Cyprus, Egypt, Greece, and Cyprus. It says, this is not an exclusive club. This can be open to every country in the Eastern Mediterranean that shares the values and purposes of this group of nations. In other words, this is not designed against Turkey. It's designed to contain the present policies of the present Turkish leadership. But should Turkey turn around and act as a like-minded nation, this is the language of modern diplomacy, LM, like-minded, uh, then it, it actually can find its place and benefit from uh, the understandings that are suggested uh, by the EMGF. But as long as Turkey speaks the language of uh, the blue homeland, Mavi uh, Vatan, as long as there are people uh, uh, close to Erdogan, uh, like uh, some of the uh, religious um, leaders or radical religious uh, figures in Turkey who speak of uh, conquest, who uh, bring back um, the ghosts of the Ottoman Empire, uh, as long as uh, Erdogan himself speaks of, uh, in the context of Hagia Sophia, speaks of Jerusalem, uh, then, uh, as this, if this is the situation, then Turkey is not like-minded, and this is the implied message. The underlying position is we rely on international law as regards the EEZ delineation, and therefore the American position and ultimately the EU position, with a very, very firm stand by France, can be decisive. France has applied for full membership of the EMGF, and I believe that this is the way forward. Indeed. Mr. Gavrielidis, when we're looking at the current situation, uh, being uh, in Cyprus, uh, being uh, an indigenous from Cyprus, and also uh, actively uh, uh, advanced in scholarship, uh, in scholarly uh, uh, activities, how do you perceive uh, the Cypriot stance vis-a-vis -vis Turkey and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the regional contenders. Of course, we see that uh, uh, your uh, leadership there is uh, very active within the, the EU institution in trying to garner uh, European support. Uh, to a certain degree, it's successful. To another degree, it seems to a little bit uh, uh, find uh, some altercations with uh, Germany over its uh, stance towards the situation. H how do you see everything built within the current context. First of all, it's very important to highlight once more that the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum is not exclusive for any country. The reason we are uh, we mention this is because we tried various times to convince Turkey to come to uh, negotiations with uh, with Cyprus, which is a state which is a full member of the EU and is not recognized by Turkey. The only country in the world that doesn't recognize the Republic of Cyprus. Uh, what is very important to mention here is that, as, as uh, Dr. Lerman also previously said, uh, Turkey is trying to expand and make the Mavi Mavadan the, the blue homeland. And, and that is a reason why we need to create the East Mediterranean Gas Forum. And by that, I would like to point out the convergences reached by the two leaders of the, of the, of the communities of the, Cyprus, of, the, of the Republic of Cyprus, the Turkish and the Greek Cypriots which occurred in 2011 and 2015, 
which include that uh, the Federal Republic of Cyprus, after the reunification, will still remain uh, a signatory member to the United Nations uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea. And also, uh, on the 2015, we see that uh, the two leaders agreed that the uh, revenues acquired from the natural resources in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, within the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus, of course, will be allocated to the federal government. So, any claims of Turkey in the, uh, claiming that uh, they, do it, they do something to protect the rights of the Turkish Cypriots are not valid and are false. They are doing that exactly for their expansionist policy of Blue Homeland, and they, we can see that across many other countries in the region, like Syria, Iraq, Libya, um, Greece, and, and also we see Turkey blackmailing the EU for for this uh, for the immigration uh, for the immigration, the refugees allowing the refugees to cross the border, and this is a reason why Cyprus has a um, has a problem uh, making the EU take action against the um, against the Republic of Turkey and actually the policy of uh, a Turkish president Erdogan. Uh, what is important also to say is that uh, during uh, Cyprus does not have actually a, a navy to, to stand against Turkey or to create this uh, crisis, to create a hot episode. Uh, the thing is that we only have our uh, diplomatic means and we use every diplomatic means we have. And this is what we try to convince even our partners in the EU that we will not allow to who make a discrimination against uh, two uh, fascist leaders, one in, the, in Belarus and one in Turkey. We are going to take sanctions for both or for uh, for for none of them. This is Indeed. something that, uh, excuse me. Indeed, uh, this is specifically speaking about the, the blocking of the EU uh, sanctions on the Belarusian uh, uh, government and, and leaders uh, uh, in uh, 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 show of protest uh, to uh, the uh, incomplacent actions by the European Union vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. Mr. Oren, I'd like to hear from you specifically. To what degree do you see this uh, current situation? We heard, of course, during the UN General Assembly uh, summit last week, a lot of uh, uh, statements with regard to this topic. Also, of course, from uh, the Cypriot uh, uh, president, uh, the, the Turkish president, and the prime, ministers, uh, prime minister of Greece and, and others, uh, with regard to the call for dialogue. Everybody is talking about dialogue. Of course, there is already preliminary dialogue, but where is it heading? Well, the problem is really personally and perhaps ideologically Erdogan, who has been in power now for 18 years already. And uh, he has changed uh, Turkish policy. Um, if you recall, in 2004, a couple of years or even less after he took uh, office, uh, the NATO um, summit was in Istanbul. And at that time, uh, the Mediterranean dialogue, which did not, of course, uh, uh, take Turkey as part of it because it had to do with non-NATO members, was expanded to the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative. And the idea was to um, join the Persian Gulf countries, the Gulf Cooperation Council, moderate countries, with the Mediterranean Dialogue countries. What happened was Turkey um, made all of this uh, process um, uh, stuck uh, because Earlier, we had, one may say, uh, a vertical cut uh, north to south in the Mediterranean. And another one, if you look across the, the land bridge of the Levant to the Gulf, again, north to south. Now we have a realignment, a new alliance, whereby some of the Mediterranean countries, such as those we mentioned um, confronting Turkey, allied with some countries in the Gulf, such as the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and behind the scenes, probably Saudi Arabia. There are other countries not so friendly, or perhaps friendlier towards Iran, such as Qatar, Oman, and Kuwait, perhaps. Kuwait is, is uh, uh, sitting on the fence. So um, Israel finds itself in a unique position between these two bodies of water, the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean, and playing a role in both. And that makes it 
a very important and vital partner to Egypt, to Jordan, to Cyprus, to Greece. Israel can do without Turkey. But if Turkey tries to confront Israel, it could pay a heavy price. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Lehman, I'd like to ask you, when I, I research the, the different uh, arenas, uh, one of my hobbies uh, is to also look at NATO activities in, in different seas. Uh, one of those uh, maneuvers uh, happens to be in the North Sea, where uh, there is a NATO exercise, a naval na NATO exercise with uh, different countries, of course, led by the United States. But uh, alongside Dutch and, and German and, and other uh, vessels, we also have Turkish vessel uh, operating there. At the same time, on uh, the Libyan front, we have the Irini operation to uh, thwart smuggling of weapons into uh, that uh, war-torn country, where on the other end of that operation, we have Turkey uh, transporting those uh, materials, uh, or purportedly so, into uh, uh, Libyan uh, territory. And then on the other hand, we have uh, NATO members uh, in, in direct conflict, or not uh, active conflict, but uh, they're, they're facing one another with uh, mock uh, uh, dogfights in the air, uh, over the Eastern Mediterranean, between Greece and, and uh, Turkey, of course. Where is everything heading at a time when we also see now the Russians entering the arena in Syria after signing an agreement uh, of uh, drillings uh, for gas in, in Syrian waters and EEZ? And at the same time, Israel is looking from the sidelines, active on a political and diplomatic level, but most certainly not engaged in a physical military capacity, uh, while at the same time, it does bolster its navy compared to previous years, realizing that the offshore gas uh, reservoir, it's, uh, it's major energy independence, if you will, for operations and, and uh, a certain lifeline in times of need. Well, uh, you certainly uh, set the stage in terms of the immense complexity of the situation, because uh, Turkey is a member of NATO, the statutes of NATO as written by Dean Acheson and others and uh, Ernst Bevin back in 1949 do not have a provision for throwing a member out because they have ceased to be like-minded. So NATO, uh, Turkey remains a member and uh, in some respects it is a member of importance because NATO still has an eye on Russian empowerment in Eastern Europe and elsewhere and Turkey almost by necessity, has to resist the rise of Russian power um, because of where it is physically. Uh, it's almost automatic. And, um, and, uh, and they're also uh, facing a Russian-backed regime in Syria, and uh, the fighting around Idlib right now is putting the Turks in a very delicate situation. It could get even more complicated because they are on the side of Azerbaijan and the Russians are on the side of the Armenians in the renewed fighting around Nagorno-Karabakh. And so um, uh, Turkey does need, at the end of the day, it cannot uh, entirely rid itself of its dependence on NATO. At the same time, the confrontation with, is not only with Greece. The confrontation is with one of the nuclear um, powers of NATO, the three nuclear powers of NATO, France, which has taken a firm position in support of Greece, Cyprus, uh, and the, the, um, the, uh, the Egyptian position on the EEZ, on Libya, and so on. And uh, you may recall that in the NATO summit, uh, Macron spoke about NATO being uh, brain dead precisely because of its inability to force Turkey to become more like-minded. So um, the situation within NATO is very delicate, and the only way I can see looking forward is uh, for an alliance which has several, let's say, layers or, or um, uh, floors. Some of the elevators will go to the upper floor of cooperation and some will remain at a lower level where Turkey would be confined to a more limited nature because you can hardly uh, share intelligence on terrorism with a country which treats Hamas leaders as, as guests and even citizens. 
Hamas is considered a terrorist organization by all NATO members except Turkey and unfortunately the Norwegians who want to keep their channels open. Uh, but every other member of NATO considers Hamas to be a terrorist organization. Turkey hosts Hamas leaders. So um, there is a problem deep within the uh, structure and the nature of, of the alliance. Don't forget Israel, that Russia did, doesn't recognize uh, Hamas as a terrorist organization. Yes, but I'm uh, talking about NATO now. Indeed. Now, the operation Irini in the Mediterranean, in the Libyan context, is not, because of this, is not a NATO operation. It's a, a singular thing. Um, EU military operation. I know that for most people, the words EU military and operation don't sit in the same sentence, but it is an EU military operation. It has to pretend that it is operating also against the supplies to Haftar and the LNA, and so they actually stopped in, in UAE shipping to Haftar, but its real purpose is to uh, hamper the capacity of Turkey to provide weapons to the GNA government in Tripoli, and the French uh, have come uh, to the edge of blows with, uh, with a Turkish ship on this question. So uh, this is a very delicate situation. The one over, I mean, there's a ray of light in all of this, which is that at the end of the day, Erdogan would go to the brink, but he is careful not to go over down into the abyss. Uh, in Libya, he has basically consented to uh, a stalemate. He, he understands that uh, if he triggers an, an Egyptian invasion, uh, there's nothing he can bring to Libya in time to match um, the 12 armored divisions of the Egyptian, or the 12 divisions of the Egyptian military, armored and mechanized divisions of the Egyptian military. Um, in, in, in Syria, they have to go careful, to be careful. Um, there's a limit beyond which I think they cannot involve themselves in, in Nagorno-Karabakh as well. And um, actually, I was looking at this, in, even with Greece, they went to the brink, and then they brought the oil trade back to port. And I was looking at this incident in which a, a drone uh, threw some red paint on a Greek flag in Castello Rezo, and I thought to myself, if they are reduced to this kind of childish um, uh, actions, it's probably because they are not going to do uh, to take to take it actually to to blows with with, with Greece. Uh, given the French position, given the, the, the Turkey cannot afford to throw itself out of the international community. It's a trading country, it's a significant economy, it's in serious economic trouble. It, the, the, I think we can operate on the assumption that there are limits beyond which Erdogan's ambitions cannot be developed. Indeed. Mr. Gavrielidis, I'd like to ask about uh, uh, the, the Cypriot stance. Uh, when we're looking at the situation, of course, uh, Dr. Lerman spoke about the race, uh, Oruk race, uh, which was pulled back uh, after seismic research for maintenance, so to speak, after trying to uh, picture it as a maintenance uh, pullback. Uh, later, President Erdogan came himself and said, no, this is also diplomatic overture. In tandem, however, we have another drilling vessel in Cypriot waters. Uh, not far from uh, the the uh, sovereign waters in, in uh, the Cypriot EEZ, which Turkey, of course, as you mentioned uh, at the beginning of the program, does not view uh, Cyprus as uh, as a legitimate state, uh, uh, viewing it as uh, Turkish uh, lands uh, by uh, uh, historic uh, uh, reasons. But uh, I'm trying to understand the, the dynamic of Cyprus in this whole picture, because earlier last month we saw U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo visit your country, speaking with uh, uh, the president about uh, various aspects pertaining to this uh, topic, but also uh, raising a red flag for Cyprus for hosting Russian ships and allowing them to dock in Cypriot uh, docks uh, uh, while 
uh, advancing operations in both Libya and Syria. Uh, is Cyprus ready on the one hand to enter the global rivalries of the superpowers as uh, uh, sticking basically with one side uh, uh, versus the other. And the other point is, uh, to what degree is uh, Cyprus concerned when the Turkish defense minister, uh, during a uh, large military exercise in uh, northern Cyprus, uh, comes and says if uh, the, the uh, southern part of Cyprus uh, is rearmed by the United States or, or anyone, uh, this would escalate into an all-out conflagration. First of all, let me say that we are very happy that Turkey removed their drill ships from the Greek exclusive economic zone, and we are hoping that it will ha this will happen for us again. Let me once again remind you what I've said before and bear that in mind. And when and our president, Mr. Anastasiadis, have already proposed to uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan to create an escrow account for the benefit of the Turkish Cypriots. And if and when the Turkish, uh, the T Turkey recognize the Republic of Cyprus within exclusive economic zone, those revenues from the acquired uh, hydrocarbon uh, resources could be released for the benefit of the Turkish Cypriots. Uh, as it relates to the to the exercise you referred to that occurred recently, that was something that is happening actually quite soon. The the northern part of Cyprus is actually occupied by Turkey and has like a very a very um, very much many troops uh, on the land, which is uh, opposed to the UN resolution, Security Council, and the, even the EU human rights uh, uh, justice system that is go those are against too. Uh, what we hope uh, from the from the lift of embargo from the United States, and it's important to mention here that the embargo was only lifted for the non-lethal weapons. So this is this is something that uh, happened recently, very recently. It was a clause of the Eastern Mediterranean pa uh, Security and Partnership Act that was uh, in, uh, introduced to the U U.S. Congress in 1929. Uh, our our stance is, of course, only uh, based on international law, the EU values, and the UN Charter. Indeed. So our stance is can only be uh, a link between all those countries that can uh, support us, and we can show to Turkey that other people do accept international law, and you have to do it too in order to be part of the region. Well, unfortunately, this is all the time that we have for today, so I'd like to thank Mr. Gavrielidis, Dr. Leoman, and Mr. Oren for being here with me today, and I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we'll see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.